Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Kingdom Age Education. I'm so glad you joined us this morning. My name is Lisa Annabelli, and I am leading a roundtable discussion. If you're hoping for me to just preach at you, it's not going to happen. I want to do a roundtable discussion with you about what God is doing on the earth today. I will get us started on this subject, but your thoughts, your questions, your comments, they are welcome on this platform. This is not a one voice platform. This is I want to hear your voice platform. I want to dialogue with you. I want to discuss with you. I want to walk with you. I want to see what God is sharing with you because I believe that many voices make up the greater picture of what God is doing on the earth today. And the days of the one voice, you listen, I speak, are over. The days of discipleship are here where we walk together and talk together. So if I say something and you don't understand, let's talk about it. Let's dialogue with it. And I will ask you and pause at times and say, what are you thinking? And so thank you for joining this platform. For you that don't know me, my name is Lisa Annabelli. I have been in ministry for since I was 19, 30 some years, 40 some years. How old am I? I guess <laughs> almost 35 years. <laughs> so I don't even know anymore. <laughs> But um, I'm writing a book uh, right now, kind of documenting the history that God brought me through in order to unveil the mystery of where I am today, because many people want to know, how did you get to where you are? Because I didn't just start out with the spirit of wes wisdom and revelation. I had to actually process through the many layers of scripture to get to the point where wisdom and re revelation actually began to bubble up out of me. And now I share things that people have never heard before. And it's not because I'm so smart. It's because I have so died to myself that literally the Holy Spirit can speak through me without my own opinion, my own agenda, my own ideas, or my own theology. It's actually just pure word of God. And that is the waters we are called to drink from. So that's a little bit about me. I do have a bachelor's degree in youth and family ministry. I do have a master's degree in education. But to be completely honest with you, the reason I got those degrees is because the enemy told me I was stupid because I was a high school <laughs> dropout. So I, I paid to get a piece of paper on the wall so that I no longer believe the lie that I'm dumb. It's the truth. <laughs> I paid a lot of money to point at a degree and say, you can call me stupid, but you're a liar because I got a 4.0 on that master's degree and I got a gold cord to prove it. And so sometimes you've got to do certain things just so that you can renew your mind and remind the enemy he's the liar, you, you're not, and God's not. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad you guys are here. And we have been unexpectedly since April, Darlene, is that when we started? April? Since April, we've been meeting every Saturday morning doing what's called Kingdom Age Education. And you can go to back messages on my YouTube channel, Lisa Annabelli, and find those sermons, messages, conversations. But we have been doing a study on the twos. We didn't realize how many twos were in scripture, but they're everywhere. And the reason it's the twos is because we serve a God that gives you a choice. You get to choose between the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. There's been choices since, since Genesis 1. And you can choose between two sons. You can be Cain or you can be Abel. You can choose between two seeds. You can be the wheat or you can be the weeds. You can choose between two cities. You can be Jerusalem or you can be Babylon. You can choose between two lovers. You can love God or you can love money. And so we've gone through multiple twos. And we will continue to find the twos as long as God reveals them to me. And then when that changes, we'll do something different. So I found accidentally while doing Bible study, just me reading the Bible, not looking for it. I found two righteousnesses. <laughs> I never knew there were two righteousnesses, but there are. And so we're going to talk about those today. And we're going to begin with a word of prayer. And so Darlene, will you open us in prayer? And then we will go from there. Hmm. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this word that we're fixing to hear, Lord, that we, as we partake and eat of the bread of life, that you uh, open our hearts, our eyes to see, our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying today. We thank you for your for each person that's here and all the ones that are going to still get on, Lord, that you would bless us, Lord, 
and open our open us up. Bless Lisa as the anointing flows through each one of us and through her with revelation you've given to her. And I thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your tender mercies are new every day. And we love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And we are just so at all of you being here with us today and in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's begin with an open discussion. What is righteousness? What have you been taught? What have you heard? What have you learned? What do you know about the word righteousness? What is it? The holiness of God. Holiness of God. Good word, Terry. It means that we're in right standing with God. Amen, Roxanne. Anybody else? What is righteousness? What have you been taught? What have you been told? I know it's a big word. It's very much a church word. You're not going to go out on the street and ask some random person on the streets of New York or Houston or LA and say, what is righteousness? Because they're not going to know the answer because it's a church word. So what, what is righteousness? You are called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What is it? Purity. Go ahead. Say it again, Marilyn. Purity. Purity. Good. Susan? Opposite of sins. Good. Or, good, sin, good. or sin people. Yep. Good. 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 Anybody else? What is righteousness? Knowing right from wrong. Good word. Yes, woman of God. Knowing right from wrong. All right. So I did a little bit of study. Every one of the answers that you have given are absolutely what it means to be what righteousness means. I call these synonyms. So the synonyms I found are holiness, which Terry mentioned, purity, uprightness, rectitude, justifiable, just as if you never sin, genuine, excellent, virtuous, honorable, or ethical. That's what it means to be righteous. Those are synonyms for righteousness. The definition of righteousness I found was freedom from guilt or sin. Freedom from guilt or sin. You know how many people live with a guilt consciousness? You cannot call yourself the righteousness of God and live with guilt. So you have to cast off guilt and remind yourself that you have been branded with the blood of Jesus that declares you righteous. Okay? It is the quality of being right, just like the woman of God said, in the eyes of God, including your character, your conscience, your conduct, and your command. Righteousness is based on God's standard. It's justice. It's equitable. It's being declared innocent, faultless, guiltless. You are declared innocent, faultless, guiltless. It's being acceptable to God. What a powerful word. A word that we throw around so freely and yet don't fully know how to wear that reality. But there's a reason why we know it but don't know how to wear it because there are two righteousnesses. And I am so excited about today because you are going to get to change righteousnesses if you want to. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. Romans chapter 9, 
is where I found the two righteousnesses. I was just reading the book of Romans because I'm the kind of person, just so you know how I study the word of God. I read chunks of scripture just to read. I don't go looking for a sermon. I don't go looking for a message. I don't go looking for a teaching. I just read the Bible for pure enjoyment. And I will read one whole book at a time. And then when I finish that book, no matter how many days it takes me to finish it, I will just move on to another book. And any of you that follow my Facebook posts or my blog, you will find that I will be quoting something and I'll be like, I was reading the book of James or I was reading the book of Romans and or I was praying the Psalms or I was looking at Proverbs, whatever the day is. Like today I was reading Proverbs 13 and you will know where I'm reading based on what I'm writing because I'm the writing is coming out of my reading. I'm not writing and then finding scripture to support what I'm writing. And some people do that. A lot of sermons that you hear are people finding a subject and then finding scriptures to support their subject. That's why they don't have a spirit of wisdom and revelation, because if you just read for enjoyment, God will reveal to you what he is saying in that day and hour in, based on what you're reading. So I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, I read until I get a revelation. And so it makes it a lot more fun because then you don't have to find 45 scriptures to support your subject. You find a revelation and then your subject unfolds out of the revelation. And here's another secret to operating in revelation and in wisdom. Change the, the um, translation that you read. Don't read just one translation. Because you get so familiar with the wording and the agenda of that translation. I know it's hard to believe that a translation has an agenda. Every translation has an agenda because every person has a method by which they read and write. So find, a, find different translations and read those. Maybe you read the Bible in a, in a year then read one version of the Bible that year, then the next year find another version of the Bible to read. And then next year find another translation and then another translation. And it's just fun because every translation adds another element of the character and nature of God. And it's really fun. And it just allows your mind to be open to different perspectives and different ways of, of the way people read or, or even speak the word of God. The newest translation out that people love is the Passion Translation. Brian Simmons has a very specific way that he hears the word of God. It's not bad. It's just different. King, King Jimmy, that's uh, King James, I call him King Jimmy. He had a very specific <laughs> way that he read the word of God. There was nothing wrong or bad about it. But if that's the only way that you hear the word of God, then you won't go to another translation and realize they hear it a little bit differently. That's why we want multiple voices in order for us to hear and surround sound what the Lord is saying. That's why you have various authors and prophets in the word of God. Moses had a certain way of speaking. That's what the Torah is. Isaiah had a certain way of prophesying. Jeremiah, Jesus had a certain way of speaking. Luke, Luke identified Jesus through the lens of a physician. Matthew identified Jesus through the lens of a, a, um, uh, an, is a, a, a really strong Jew. Matthew was very Jewish. John had the, the perspective of a lover in the way he articulated what Jesus said and did. Paul was a Pharisee. And when you read his book, Peter said Paul was hard to understand at times because he had such a high level of Jewish understanding that even Gentiles, when they read Paul, they don't even understand what Paul's talking about. And then you have James, who's actually, actually the book of James should be called the book of Judah because his Hebrew name is Judah. The Gentile name is James. He has a whole different perspective, very practical about how we use the tongue and how rich people are. So do you see how the word of God is diverse in its authors? 
that's why we need to read diverse translations because different men and different women bring different revelation in order for us to understand. Okay. So I'm reading out of the new American standard Bible. doesn't mean that's the only Bible you have to read out of. It's just the one I read out of when it comes to my physical Bible. I have multiple digital Bibles that I read out of right now. I'm reading out of the English standard version, but I wanted to go to my new American standard because this is what I was reading out of when I read Romans nine. And here's what it says, starting in verse 30. Are you ready? This is the subject. Well, let me back up to verse 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Okay. Israel is so many people. It's like the sand of the sea, but only a portion of Israel is going to be saved because salvation only comes through one man, Jesus Christ. And most of Israel does not believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth that walked the earth was the Messiah. They don't believe it. They don't believe the man that we believe in that walked the earth was the Messiah. A remnant of them believed, but the majority of them did not. And so Paul is saying to them, he's saying to the Roman Jews Here's the deal. Only a remnant believed that Yeshua HaMashiach was the Messiah that was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth. The man that was crucified on the cross with two robbers, one on either side of him. They still don't believe that that man was the Messiah. Okay. So that's what this is talking about. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left to us a posterity, a children, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What is he talking about? Sodom and Gomorrah was a place of desolation and decay. And he's saying if there wasn't a remnant that believed in the word of life, they would have become a desolate and decayed nation. But the reason they're still alive today is because there is a remnant of Jews that believe in Yeshua, the Messiah. That's what he's talking about. So he says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness even the righteousness which is by faith there's one righteousness righteousness by faith is one of your righteousnesses but israel pursuing a law of righteousness there's your second righteousness there is the righteousness by faith and there is the law of righteousness did not arrive at that law why because they did not pursue it by faith pursue what by faith righteousness but as though it were by works they stumble over the stumbling stone just as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Okay, you're like, how in the heck did you get two righteousness out of that? Because it says that there are two righteousnesses. There is righteousness by faith, and there is the law of righteousness. Can everybody see that in those scriptures? Yes? Yes. I yes, see you it. can see it. Okay. Did you ever know there were two righteousnesses? No. Me neither. <laughs> That's the fun thing about you guys. I didn't either. Remember, we're learning together. There are two righteousnesses. And may I propose to you that the church 
because we're all Gentiles, I'm assuming, the church has preached both righteousnesses. The law of righteousness and the righteousness by faith. <laughs> that is why you still struggle with guilt. If you only had the righteousness by faith and in operation inside of you, you would no longer feel guilty for anything. The law of righteousness is what produces your guilt. So let's start with the law of righteousness and talk about where is it, what is it, and how, what does it produce in us? So the law of righteousness is found in the old covenant. The law of righteousness is a law you can never measure up to. Have you ever felt like you don't measure up? Have you ever struggled with guilt and sin consciousness have you ever heard messages that remind you of your sin and then you feel guilty? Has anyone ever rubbed your nose in your mistakes? That is the law of righteousness. In the law of righteousness, you will never measure up because the law was established in order to remind you and show you your sin. That was the whole point of the law of righteousness. To point out to you that you're a sinner. What is the number one way evangelists preach salvation? What's the number one thing you're supposed to point out in order to get saved? When an evangelist comes, what do they point out to you? They, they're always crying out, repent of your sins. Right. They want you to be made aware of your sin. With all due respect to all y'all that are evangelists, that's the law of righteousness. You're letting them know you don't measure up. Yeah. And you know where we, we get it from the New Testament. If you confess your sins, you mm. shall be saved. Thanks. Right? Yeah. That's where we get it. But what we don't understand is that we're actually inviting them into a law of righteousness. Identifying their sin. Because we're concerned if they don't confess their sin, if you don't confess your sin, if I don't confess my sin, then you cannot be saved. I have to acknowledge my sin in order to be saved from sin. You, you tell me one person that does not realize sin is not working for them. I didn't say that they're not enjoying it. You wouldn't sin if it wasn't enjoyable. Sex is fun in the moment drinking is fun in the moment pride is fun in the moment pornography is fun in the moment but the fruit of all these things that we call sin are only enjoyable in the moment they're never fun after gambling is fun in the moment Abortion feels like you've been liberated from a responsibility in the moment. Right? I mean, it, am I like, has anybody else done something <laughs> sinful? Stealing feels right in the moment. Maybe I'm confessing all my old sins to y'all. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, can anybody else agree with me that in the moment you enjoyed it or you would have never done it? Yes, in the moment, and then after that moment passes, then the guilt runs in. Ah, come on, preach, Terry. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I'm yep. not saying that the consequences of it are enjoyable, but I'm saying temptation would not tempt you if it wasn't tempting. Do I need to say that again for those in the back? Temptation would not tempt you if it wasn't tempting. Right. I ain't mad at you for it. We've all done it. But what hits you after you sin? Guilt. Yeah. The law of righteousness rises up and tells you, you dirty, rotten sinner, you suck. Hmm. And then it creates in you what? Shame. 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 Shame in the garden. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you feel the law of righteousness inside of you by these things that I'm just like, let's just be honest with each other. Every one of us has experienced it. Every single person that's operating in, in sin has a shame and guilt consciousness about them. They're not free. They post their pictures of like whining and dining and all the things, but they aren't free. You know it and I know it because we've been there. We post the highlight reel of sin. We never talk about the decay that's going on on the inside. So then you come to church and what do they do? They remind you that you're a dirty, rotten sinner that needs a savior. Lisa, you, uh, go the, ahead, darling. The scripture that's coming up, man, first John, where it says, you know, confess your sins one to another and he's faithful to forgive you. Yep. Oh, I mean, so it's oh, since we're not under the law of righteousness, I mean, don't we need to still confess? Is that I'm, I'm trying to get all this in my head now because like, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on. Walk with me. Okay. So here's another thing about me. I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm not making okay. a statement yet. Okay. 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 I'm I'm not in any way saying that we don't need to confess our sin. What I'm trying to get you to realize is that the matrix of, of Babylonian Christianity has put us under the law of righteousness. Okay. When and the law of, go ahead. When we repent, we're supposed to give it to God and then let go of it and not pick it back up again. Right. But when you go to church and they preach the gospel of salvation and they keep you nailed to a cross, they never bring you into the kingdom because they've got you under the law of righteousness that tells you you're never going to measure up. Okay. All right. The farther away from the cross you get, the less desire you have to sin. You see... What we have been taught is that if I point out your faults, that's to get you to turn away from what your fault is. But the kingdom doesn't point out your faults. The, the kingdom shows you what's so flipping amazing about the kingdom that you don't even have a desire to sin anymore. Because we're living in the resurrection. You're living in the power of God. Mm -hmm. so is, is that why the Catholics always keep Jesus on the cross? Come on, there you go. Mm -hmm. yep they yep. never they never show you a cross without jesus on it yep because they want to remind you what you did to him and as long as i'm tethered to a crucifixion i will never operate from a place of resurrection hmm. as long as you're tethered to the crucifixion you will never operate in the resurrection. The whole point of your baptism was to die to sin, but not to keep you under the water, to lift you up and out of it so that you could go free and live a new life. What did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? Go and sin go no more. Go and sin, sin no more. No more. He did not shame her or condemn her for what she did. The only thing he said to her, number one, do any of them accuse you? Number two, neither do I. Number three, go and sin no more. Did he not? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
because he was operating out of resurrection, not crucifixion. Resurrection is evidence that you know that you died to sin and you want to live for him. So the law of righteousness is the old covenant. It's a never measure up thing that's inside of you. It's, a, it's the measuring rod that says you'll never be good enough. And if you live under that spirit of I'm never going to measure up, I'm never going to be good enough, you will continually live with guilt and shame. You will never walk in power and authority. And so, unfortunately, people that live with a guilt and shame conscience only know how to lead with guilt and shame. People that live with a never measure up rod of the law of righteousness inside of them only know how to make other people feel like they'll never measure up. So that's why we have to break the law of righteousness off of you before we can actually align you, tether you to righteousness by faith. That's why I'm going to take a minute and try to deconstruct you break this off of you get this barnacle off of you that has actually not been serving you well you would have never called it the law of righteousness on operation inside of you but you're going to realize as i share this to you that we actually very much operate under the law of righteousness so the law of righteousness was introduced to reveal your sin to you it is a, watch this, the law of righteousness is a do something to get something mindset or standard. I've got to do something to get something. Now watch this. The prosperity gospel was all about sow a thousand dollars to reap a thousand dollars sow money to reap money i'm just using that because it's such an easy example okay mm -hmm. there's always eat the meat and spit out the bones in everything you've ever been taught so we're just spitting out some bones okay there's a lot of meat in that gospel i'm not telling us to go back under a vow of poverty that's not what i'm saying but the idea that you sow money to reap money is I have to do something to get something. It's the law of righteousness. In the kingdom, you can sow something in somebody's life, whether it's your time, your energy, your help, your like Darlene was helping her neighbors clean up um, after barrel came through. Maybe it's bringing food to a widow. Maybe it's, you know, going and visiting somebody in the hospital. All the things that Jesus said, when did we do those things for you? He said, when you did it under the least of these, you did it unto me. Okay. You didn't go visit a widow so that when you become a widow, somebody will come visit you. You never did that. You went and did that. And then you found that somebody else unrelated, maybe gave you a hundred bucks and you didn't even know why. You see, we have been taught you got to plant a mango seed in order to reap a mango. I got to plant a financial seed in order to reap a financial harvest. That's not how the kingdom works. Any seed you plant in the kingdom, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. Doesn't matter what seed you plant. You will reap a harvest for any seed you plant. That's why, and you all know this, that have followed me, I will not be taking an offering at the end of this message. Because the seeds I'm planting are words into you so that I can reap a harvest of righteousness, maybe not from you, but maybe from somewhere else. Just because I sow into this field called this Zoom call doesn't mean I'm looking for this Zoom call to be the only harvest I'm going to reap. Because words are seeds and they are eternal. They go out into the airwaves and produce more than this harvest could ever could. 
but the law of righteousness tells you you have to do something to get something. And it's just not true. I don't give things to my son in order to get something from my son. Mm -hmm. I do things for my son because I love my son. Mm -hmm. And then I reap things in other people that I didn't even sow. Doesn't the Bible say that? Yeah. You will you will live in houses that you didn't even build. You will you will drink from vineyards that you didn't even plant. How is that possible? Because righteousness by faith sows a seed in one place and reaps it in another. But under the law of righteousness, if you don't sow a seed of $1,000 at the end of this message, you're not going to reap $1,000. Because I'm good soil. You better sow into me because I'm good soil. I am good soil, but you don't have to sow into me. Maybe what I'm giving you is you reaping because you sowed into somebody else. And now you're standing in this field, reaping out of the harvest of my life. Even if you didn't sow nothing into my life, you're reaping out of a harvest you didn't even sow into. Because that's the, that's the way the kingdom works. Righteousness by faith works that way. But the law of righteousness says, nope. You go to my church, you better sow into my church, you better sow into my ministry, and I'm your covering and all the things. That's the law of righteousness. And we didn't even know we were under it. They're not malicious. They're not doing anything to harm you. They just don't have a revelation about the two righteousnesses. And that's okay. So we don't get, remember, we don't get mad at anybody. The only reason we're identifying these things is so that we can realize, oh my gosh, that's the law of righteousness. And then my goal is to teach it to you in such a practical way that you can go and help somebody else get free from it. Because I'm telling you, if we were free from guilt and shame, we would operate in power and authority. And I need a church that operates in power and authority, not in guilt and shame. Okay. So where did this whole thing come from? Exodus chapter 19. It's an old covenant, law of righteousness. And it and it, it is this idea. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6 say this. Uh, let me just start in verse 1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. So they're three months out of Egypt. On that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camp camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in the front of the mountain. Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people, for all of the earth is mine. Do you realize that they could not be the people of God unless they obeyed the voice of God? Right. The law of righteousness was, you must obey my voice to be my people. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. God was about to reveal to them their sin. And he said, if you don't do this, you can't have that. It was an if then law. Mm -hmm. The reason it was an if then law is because it was a law of righteousness that God used for a short season in order to reveal to Israel their sin. Do you realize that they did not recognize what sin was until there was a law? Right. And the law was created by God to give them power over sin versus. Yes. Yes. Them. 
But can you imagine living your life not knowing you were a sinner? No. <laughs> they did not know they were a sinner until they were given the law. Can you imagine? It was so a hard if, generation. Yeah, so if they didn't know they were a sinner until they were given the law, and the law was given to reveal sin, and Jesus came and fulfilled the law and the prophets, they didn't have sin consciousness before the law, and don't we live after the law? Yes. Why do we have sin consciousness? Because we're still we're still under the law. <laughs> the only thing we don't believe we need the law for is to get saved. For it is by grace you have been saved, not by works. Right? Martin right. Luther. None of you are trying to earn your salvation. But now that you are saved, every one of you is trying to earn God's favor, his pleasure. You're trying so hard not to be a sinner because you have been taught under the law of righteousness. And don't think that I'm over here saying that we don't sin because that is not what I'm saying. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth is not in you. Right. I know my Bible. I am not in any way propagating or trying to say that we do not sin. What I'm trying to get off of you is a sin consciousness that keeps you out of a kingdom reality. Because whatever you're fixated on, you will become. Our countenance as Christians reveals we are under the law of righteousness we look like we don't measure up we live like we're caught in sin and we're dirty rotten sinners saved by grace and that we're just tolerated by god and other people our countenance reveals that christians are crabby critical hard to be with angry Bitter, unforgiving, hurt, wounded, damaged. Why? You think Jesus walked around? <laughs> Dirty, rotten sinners. Look at all these sinners here on earth, God. Why do you say that? Right. <laughs> He didn't do that. Every time the man came up against somebody, came up to a blind dude, the disciples said, who sinned? This man or the his parents? Who sinned? Jesus like, neither. What? Can you imagine how revolutionary that was in a sin conscious law of righteousness time in history? Jesus said, neither. This man was born blind to display the glory of God. His parents didn't sin and he didn't sin. This man, he's blind so that I can reveal to you the glory of God. Amen. Do you see the difference in the way Jesus thought versus the way we think and the way mm -hmm. the Jews thought? The Jews were under the law of righteousness, even though Jesus was standing right there. We are 2,000 plus years away from the cross and we are still under the law of righteousness. And if Jesus walked up to you and said, if we walked up to Jesus in a bar and said, hey, See that drunk guy right there? Who sinned? Him or is that a generational curse that he's dealing with? Jesus would be like, a what? <laughs> a who? I'm sitting in this bar to display the glory of God. To break the shame and guilt off this man. 
to uproot every seed of death and decay that's in him. Sin? You obviously have no idea what sin is. I'm standing here. I'm the savior of the world that took away the sin of the world. I'm here to display the glory of God. I'm not here to be sin conscious. I'm here to extract people from the grip of death and bring them into eternal life starting right now. Do you hear the difference from the law of righteousness versus righteousness by faith? So the Ten Commandments were the umbrella law of righteousness. They were the umbrella law of righteousness. And we have to go back to Galatians to understand what was the law given for? Okay. What was, I mean, what was the whole point of even having a law? That's where Paul says, because Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And if you don't understand the Old Testament, you'll never understand what Paul's talking about. So Galatians 3 verse 10 says, for as many are the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, him who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would not receive, so that we would receive the promise of the spirit through faith. And then in verse 19 says, Galatians 3, 19, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels, by the agency of a mediator until the seed, which is Christ, would come to whom the promise had been made. Verse 23. Therefore, before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith that was later to be revealed. You cannot be under the law of righteousness and operate by faith. You can't do both. And yet the church has been teaching you both. You've been locked out of faith as long as you are living under the law. The law is a tutor. The law was given as a tutor to teach you about faith. The law was added because of sin. So anyone that operates in sin is operating under the law. Okay, tell me what you're thinking. Does that make sense or am I confusing you? You're expanding my mind. <laughs> I can, I can feel your intellectual muscles stretching. First John says, first John says, if you sin, we have an advocate, which means you don't have to sin. You see, you've been taught you're a sinner saved by grace. That's why the idea of not sinning blows your mind. Sin is harm to self or harm to others. I don't have to harm myself and I don't have to harm others. 
That's why the new covenant is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Instead of harm to self or harm to others, I love self and I love others. Talk to me. Does that am I making sense to you guys? If you sin, you have an advocate, but you don't need to be sin conscious. You don't need to operate in guilt. You confess your sin and then you move on. You don't have to wallow in your sin. You don't have to over repent. Repent means return to your first love. Love of God and love of people. Go ahead, Terry. I have a t-shirt that says, I am not ashamed to call upon his name. Yes, yes. But you see how tethered you are to the cross? That the idea of moving away from it scares you. Right. That is the law of righteousness that you have been so dipped in through church culture. Yep. Rather than kingdom reality. God is not looking for you to sin. He wants you to rule and reign with him. But you cannot rule and reign with him if you're going to harm others or harm yourself. He's looking for governors of righteousness. Because righteousness exalts a nation. Jesus rules with a rod of righteousness because he didn't come to harm us. He came to help us. When you see someone in sin, don't harm them by rubbing their nose in their sin. Help them by pulling them out of their sin. Let them know there's a redeemer. There's a deliverer. There's a savior that'll get you out of this mess. It doesn't matter that how you got into it. There is a savior that'll get you out of it. Do you hear the good news in the righteousness by faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is calling the gold out in people, not rubbing the sin into them. Righteousness by faith is Abraham, who had just come out of Ur of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon. He had just come out of Babylon. He was an astrologer. His father was a Babylonian priest that operated with Baal as a priest of Baal. So his father had just died. He was to take on the priesthood. Abraham was a king who had 300 fighting men that went to war to, to rescue Lot who had went to Sodom and Gomorrah and didn't want to leave. These were not righteous men. And yet God says that Lot's righteous soul was vexed by what he saw in Sodom. Why was Abraham so willing to sacrifice Isaac? Because child sacrifice was commonplace in Babylon. You make these men out to be these saints that float on clouds and wear halos. They had no sin consciousness. That's why they could sacrifice babies and not even worry about it. That's why Moses was thrown in a basket into the river. They had no regard for human life.
And yet God said that Abraham was credited. He was given a credit because by faith, he believed God would give him a son out of his own house. It was a credit. It wasn't earned. It was a credit. Under the law, you give something to get something. You have to earn it. For the wages of sin is death. You earn death by sinning. But the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 3.23. Faith is not something you earn. It's something you're given. Righteousness is not something you earn. It's something you're given. You've been given righteousness. You didn't earn the blood of Jesus by your confession of sin. You possessed righteousness by accepting the blood of Jesus. You accessed righteousness by believing that the blood of Jesus has set you free. How can you earn what you've accepted? Gentiles found what the Jews couldn't. Gentiles appropriated what the Jews couldn't. And now the Gentile church is not trying to earn salvation. They're trying to earn everything else. The Jews never tried to earn anything but salvation and forgiveness of sins. And now the Gentiles don't try to earn salvation. They try to earn everything else. The devil is a freaking liar. If the Jews could believe what we believe about Jesus, they would be saved. And if the Gentiles could believe what the Jews believed about everything else, we could operate as a kingdom. you see how the enemy has tricked us? Okay, I'll give you salvation, but you're going to earn everything else. I'm going to riddle you in shame and guilt and make you feel like you're a schmuck and you're going to be poor and, and you're going to be angry and you're going to be bitter and you're going to love money and you're going to be mad at people and you're going to not forgive, but you're saved and you're going to heaven in the sweet by and by. One day, everything's going to be great for you guys. Do you know the Jews never believed in a sweet by and by? They believed in heaven on earth. Why do you think they're the wealthiest people on the earth? Why do you think they don't struggle with earthly issues? The only thing they struggle with is that Jesus was the Messiah. That's our only battle. The battle we won, they struggle with. And we struggle with everything they don't. We don't believe we're the head and not the tail. We don't believe we're above and not beneath. We don't believe that we're the lender and not the borrower. We don't believe that. They do. Because we're over here under the law of righteousness trying to earn everything but our salvation. And they're over there under the law of righteousness, not trying to earn anything but their salvation. Why are they building another temple? Why are they wanting some heifer to be born? Because they're trying to earn their salvation. Through the blood of bulls and goats.
Romans 10 says righteousness based on faith speaks a better word. Romans 4 says righteousness is a credit, a reward, not a wage. And then circumcision is a seal to reveal righteousness, not earn it. Genesis 12 said that Amos or Abraham was promised to be the heir of the world because he believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Psalm 2 says of Jesus, ask of me and I will give the nations as your inheritance. Matthew 28 tells us all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And then he gives it to us and says, now you go and make disciples of all nations. If we would quit trying to earn righteousness, we would actually reign and rule. But we're so stuck in a, in a wage, a wages law of righteousness that we don't know how to even be inheritors of all that Jesus gave us. Yeah, we say we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, but we don't reign and rule as though we are because we're so sin conscious, we don't think we can. We believe we're schmucks and we're under shame and guilt. What was that last verse? Genesis 12. You see, faith equals grace. The empowerment to reign and rule and not harm anyone. And the law is what brings wrath. So you know whether you're operating by the righteousness by faith or the law of righteousness based on whether you're operating in a wrath mentality or a grace mentality. And I'm telling you, most people preach the Bible to scare you, not to liberate you. That's how you know they're under the law of righteousness. And I don't care what book of the Bible they preach, but let's just pick Revelation. How many people preach the book of Revelation and it doesn't have something to do with wrath? That shows you they're under the law of righteousness. They're not operating in righteousness by faith. Because the book of Revelation is in a, a revelation of Jesus Christ, not of signs, seals, beasts, or dragons. Not of trumpets, not of tribulations, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 1 says. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not a righteousness of wrath, it's a righteousness of faith. And the more you read it, and the more you find Jesus in it, Darlene, is it not the most enjoyable book that we're reading? We had so much fun on Thursday reading Revelation 11 that we were laughing, joking, and giggling. <clears throat> Romans 5 says that revelation by faith gives you peace with God and grace in which you stand and the hope of glory. Peace, grace, and hope is what you get when you operate under righteousness by faith. But if you're under the law of righteousness, you're operating under sin, judgment, wrath, and shame and guilt. Do you see the difference in the two righteousnesses? The law of righteousness is the wrath of God the wages of sin, and a tutor. You're locked out of faith if you're under the law of righteousness. If you are under the righteousness by faith, you have peace with God, you have rewards, and you become a lover of God and a lover of people. The choice is ours. Do you want to operate by the law or by faith? You get to pick one.
talk to me. I'm smiling at you. <laughs> you guys are, you look like great students. Your, your brains are exploding. Your faces are crunched. You're like, I've never been told this, right, woman of God? <laughs> Lisa, yep. um, may I ask a question? Um, Please, Michelle. As you, were, as, as you were talking, I was thinking of uh, James and double-mindedness. Yes, ma'am. And the two. Um, so, I mean, it is like an all or nothing choice, but. Like I, I'm an ex-Catholic, so I know that there was a lot of uh, uh, law of righteousness planted in me, and so, and then the the wheat and the tears grow up together. So, I mean, what what you're speaking is uh, speaks to me very deeply, and and it makes me uh, realize that there could be uh, a going back and forth between the two because of a previously planted seed. Yes. Um, yeah. But all, all you can do is, is just keep focusing on Father. And so what I've been doing is like, I know Father is a consuming fire. So I just uh, go to him to, to burn out um, all of the uh, bad seed yeah from my childhood yeah but I, I do think that we while you're going through that it can cause double-mindedness absolutely and it's <laughs> it's amazing you're talking about that because I write a blog every day and I wrote this morning about this very subject about the parable of the the wheat and the weeds and and Jesus um, is saying the parable and and the harvester said did you not plant good seed in your harvest field where did these weeds come from and the bible says in matthew 13 an enemy did this he planted weeds while men were sleeping so when we are not awake because revelation means awakened when we are not operating from a spirit of revelation and people are not teaching us out of revelation then we are asleep and we just receive the weeds and then now we're in a harvest season and therefore the wheat and the weeds have both matured and it can feel like you're double-minded because you have both in your field your field is your life. You have both going off in your mind. But the reason God is revealing the maturity of both the wheat in you and the weeds in you is not to shame you. It says in Matthew 13, bind, bundle, and burn the weeds, then gather the wheat into my barn. So he's actually in a season of separation inside of us right now so that we can be gathered with wheat alone. Because weeds choke out, weeds harm wheat. <clears throat> and he does not want anything inside of you that's going to harm you. And the more you surrender to the separation going off inside of you, the easier it is for him to bundle and burn and bind the weeds that's why Jesus said, John said about Jesus, I came to baptize you with water, but he's coming with the Holy Spirit and with fire, fire mm -hmm. to burn out that which is harming you, not to burn you up because he's mad at you. So that's a great analogy, Michelle, of what you're saying. Thank you. That's awesome. That's good news. Amen. It's always good news with Jesus. Yes, yes. Anybody else? What you thinking? I have something. Yeah, Susan, come on. Um, if you have ever watched The Chosen, mm -hmm. um, 
the difference between that law of righteousness versus faith in the very time that Jesus was on earth, you can watch all through the episodes how the Pharisees are just berating everybody with the law and everything that Jesus comes back and, and says during that time is exactly the, the righteousness of faith. Yes. And so, and I'm actually going back and rewatching those, uh, all those episodes through season four. Yeah. And I just, I did not realize that was going on until this morning. So right. very good. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's, that's a great way to, to share it because now when you guys go back and read the gospels, all right, bye Lorena. Bye Terry. Um, when you guys go back and read the Gospels, you're going to hear righteousness by faith coming out of the words of Jesus. And you're going to hear the law of righteousness coming out of the other people that are speaking. And it's going to reveal to you how they were thinking and how Jesus was countering with a righteousness by faith that he was bringing. Because and he, also, go ahead. And also, you could see how much the disciples were enmeshed in the in that law when they were tr just starting to follow him. Yes. And how they also had to learn this difference as they went along and followed him. Right. People that say, "If I was walking the earth when Jesus walked the earth, I wouldn't have acted like the disciples." You, <laughs> you don't realize how much you are dipped in your culture called Christianity until you encounter Christ. He is not Christian culture. He is his own kingdom. That's why the way is narrow because you have got to be stripped of all of your culture that is the Broadway. Even though we are a Judeo-Christian culture in America, we are not a kingdom culture. There is no culture in the world that is kingdom culture. It is its own culture. I don't care if it's Africa, Asia, Australia, America. It does not matter. None of them are kingdom culture. And if every one of us doesn't take off our culture, we cannot come into the kingdom. And Jewish culture is not the kingdom of God. And neither is American culture, neither is African culture, neither is Asian culture. The kingdom of God is its own culture because just talking today you realize how much christian culture has absolutely operated in the law of righteousness because if we didn't there would be no shame no guilt there would be no question about dominion there would be no doubt about ruling and reigning there would be no question if you're forgiven there would no be there would be no fear of eternal life am i going to make it through the pearly gates None of that. We wouldn't be afraid of death. We wouldn't be afraid of anything. We wouldn't be so tethered to the cross that we can't walk away from it. Colossians says that he nailed the certificate of debt that was levied against us. He nailed it to the cross. That means there you, have, you are not in debt. In any way, you are operating out of credit, not debt. But do you notice they call it a debt card, your debit card, when you actually have money in there? But then your credit card is what puts you in debt? If it was a true credit card, it should be the money you have. And then your debit card should be money you don't have. But they give us a debt card for money we do have, and they give us a credit card for money we don't have. What a screwed up system. 
Well, it's to remind us where we're supposed to be. Exactly. It's remind it's us to keep us under the thumb because it's just like, you know, I, I get in so many situations and, and I'll like, well, you know, trying to bring in the reality of it and then I'll get this, oh, you have little faith. Oh, you have little faith. And then I'm like, I just feel like I'm a bad Christian because I'm yep. ye of little faith. Yep. You know, and, and they teach this, you know, the fruit that's inside of you, the fruit that's inside of you is what comes out in a bad situation. So when a bad situation comes out and I get angry, then I'm like, oh man, I'm a bad Christian because I got angry. Right. You know, right. and it's just a constant, it just kind of sometimes feels like a constant belittlement that there's no way you can be a good Christian because this is happening. Well, hmm. and the thing is, you're not you're not called to be a good Christian. You're yeah. called to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. You're you, you are you are covered over by the blood of Jesus because Christ lives in me. Remember that song? I am covered over with the robe of righteousness because Jesus lives in me. You see, we don't wear the clothes our father gave us. We're still yeah. wearing the rags of sin, hell and the grave. We're still wearing the, the clothes of sin and shame and guilt. Those mm. are dirty rags. That's why Jesus said, I'm coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a bride that is literally operating in the clothes of righteousness that he gave her. Yeah, and until, to... oh, go ahead. We need to stop reminding people of the sin they're in and start showing them the scripture of how to walk out of it and be alive. And that's what happens way too much is you're reminded of how bad the sin is that you, you know, and it's, you know, being angry, you know, sin is sin. There's not a, a level of this is a bad sin. This is a good sin. But instead of saying, hey, it's okay to be angry today. Let's find the scripture to walk you out of anger instead of saying, oh, you're a bad Christian because you're being angry. Right. And the other thing is sin is harm to self or harm to others. Yeah. So when we tell them it's OK to be homosexual, we're telling them it's OK to harm yourself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You see, we've gone the other direction and now we don't want to even help anybody that's harming themselves because we're afraid we're going to offend them. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you're just letting them remain in their harm of self. If they don't want to come out of their sin, there's nothing you can do about it. They have a free will. But the reality is any sin that we are living in, it's harming us first and then it's harming others. And I don't want you to harm yourself. Anger is something inside of you that's harming you. And then it comes out of you and harms others. Remember what Jesus said? You have heard that it was said, do not murder. But I say to you, do not be angry. Sexual sin is harming of self. You're doing violence to yourself and you're doing violence to someone else. And we just say, it's okay. The kids have sex before marriage or they live together before they get married. My thought is you can do whatever you want. I just want you to know you're harming yourself and you're harming others. And I don't want you to do that. That's the only reason I'm not saying this to shame you or guilt you. I'm saying this because I love you. I don't want you to do harm to yourself. And I don't want you to do harm to others because we're called to love the Lord, our God and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That is the three cord strand of love that cannot be broken. Love God, love self, love others. And whichever one they can love first, I don't care. We've just got to get love in them so mm -hmm. they stop harming. But see, we've made sin about sin because we're under the law of righteousness. So then we talk about sin 
or we talk about missing the mark or we talk about you've got to repent. What does that even mean to repent? I want to throw up a huge stop sign and say, please don't harm yourself. Can you stop? You're hurting yourself. I don't want you to hurt. It's almost like a pleading. I'm pleading with you. Will you please stop harming yourself? That's killing you. For the wages of sin is death. But do you see how when you put it in the word of harm rather in the word of sin, how you're operating out of righteousness by faith rather than the law of righteousness and you're removing shame and guilt off of them rather than heaping shame and guilt on them? Right. Right. A little tweaking of the language actually changes it from the law of righteousness to righteousness by faith. Righteousness is righteousness. It is a holy standard. It's purity. It's virtuousness. It's ethical. It's the plumb line. Righteousness is the plumb line. That doesn't change. But if they're under the law of righteousness, it comes with condemnation. If we're under righteousness by faith, it comes with good news. But righteous, I don't want you to ever think righteousness changes. It does not. The standard of righteousness remains the same. It's the way we approach it that changes. It just breaks my heart because I've taught this wrong, you know, over the years. It's like, oh my gosh, Lord. <laughs> it's just so but, easy. But, you know, you, you, when we've been taught for so many years and you're under that law. And it's like, Lord, yeah. I put people in bondage. Yeah. In bondage instead of setting them free. And, so, and do you, oh, go ahead. I think, it was, I think it was taught that way because they wanted to control us. Right. And, and it was taught that way to keep us coming back to church and to keep us honoring the person who taught mm -hmm. us that instead of setting us free to go out there and teach others the good, they've taught it the way they've taught it to to keep us in bondage yeah so, so we keep returning yeah because if i set you free you're not going to show back up again yep and and we need to set them free so they don't have to show back up again so they can or, go out there and spread spread the good news or you actually come to the realization that the more i control people the more they want away from me but the more i liberate people the more they want to be around me right exactly I want to be away from people that control me. I want to be around people that want to liberate me. Amen. I don't get set free to go buck wild. I get, it is for freedom that I have been set free. Absolutely. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have set us free if he thought we would run away. He set us free because he knew we would run to him, not from him. So, so most people that don't run to him are not really free. They've been taught a Jesus that isn't the Jesus of the Bible. They've been taught another gospel. It does not change the standard of righteousness, you guys. Because here's the deal. If you teach the law of righteousness, your love will grow cold. But if you teach righteousness by faith, your love will never run out. Love is the only well that never runs dry. That's why the Bible says, with the increase of lawlessness, the love of many grows cold. Because people want to break free from the law. But when you really love someone and you go to them and reveal to them, I love you so much, I don't want you to harm yourself. I don't want the seeds of death and decay inside of you. It just brings a whole nother way of, of helping people get out of their sin. They are in sin. They are. We're not denying sin. We're approaching it, not from the law, but from faith. It's the royal law of love that we're approaching it from. 
not the tutor of the law that locks us out of faith. Now, do you understand why our evangelistic crusades have not produced kingdom citizens that rule and reign and run away from sin? Because our law of righteousness has tethered them to the cross and keeps reminding them that they're dirty, rotten sinners. Saved by grace, but still a dirty, rotten sinner. But if we could actually teach them the righteousness by faith, they would fall in love with this man and not want to walk in sin. Because they would start to learn how loved they are, and his perfect love would cast out all fear. And they would want to remain in love and not do anything to harm themselves or harm others. That's why faith, hope, and love remain, but love is the greatest of these. Love God, love people, love yourself. For you that have been listening by the recording, thank you so much. I hope this was a blessing to you. Until next week, have a great day.